is a week. We have uh, several of the kids are starting back to school. I know Brielle is, she was telling me about Anybody else starting back to school this week? Yeah, 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 just kind of that, that time, starting back to school. Um, I have to say that going through like elementary and junior high and that, that, that wasn't all that fun. Well, not the way it was supposed to be fun. Um, but when I went to when I went to college, I got, that was, those were some of the best years of my life. I loved being in school at that point because at that point I really wanted to learn. <laughs> I really wanted to digest whatever I could in order to you know prepare for the ministry, and it was just like I just I just ate that up. And and there are times that I wish I could go back and be in that atmosphere again, that environment again, to we're just learning all the time and being around other people who were also learning, and we got to share with one another. You know the thoughts we had and and as we grew um, so for those of you that are headed off to school this week go get them huh <laughs> I'm sharing this morning uh, we're continuing in Philippians maybe we're not maybe that's the thunder from Houston I don't know um, this morning as I get started, I just wanted to kind of share, open with a story, that as I had gone to, I had, as I had gone to Warner and uh, prepared for the ministry, after that, we began, you know, put out my uh, resume, such as it was, you know, that uh, I had uh, gone through school and I was looking for a church to pastor and, uh, and follow God's, you know, leading in my life. And I sent off my uh, resume a couple of different places. I sent them to some of the, what we call directors or area administrators or whatever of different of regions in the, in the country, and especially on the West Coast. And I got two replies. And one was, uh, one was from Colville up in, in uh, Washington. It's up toward the, the Canadian border up above Spokane. And the other place was Culver City, down in California, down in the mix of uh, the LA suburb. I'd grown up in Los Angeles, and I was certainly familiar with being in, in LA, and it was kind of home to me. And, and uh, there are some things that are, that are still good about LA. The food, you can find fantastic food in Los Angeles. You can go to the mountains if you can see through the, the smog and find the mountains. You can go to the mountains in a day. You can go down to the beach in a day. You can go to Disneyland and you can go to Knott's Bay. You can do all those kinds of things. So there were some you know, positive things about uh, Los Angeles and things that kind of drew us there. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, I, I was on the fence was my, my mom kind of wanted us to go to Culver City because my family still lived in L.A. And my mom wanted to have us right there at home with her. And uh, that was kind of a double-edged kind of thing. I said, I'm not sure I want my mom coming to church every Sunday morning. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I mean, she'd probably be the most loyal person within the congregation, but I'm just not sure I wanted that kind of light uh, shined on me. Uh, Colville was the, really the exact opposite. Colville was a small town, 4,000 people in Colville on a good day. And uh, it was it's pretty, it's very beautiful setting, uh, good people, but really there was like really two opposite ends of the spectrum, and we were being you know pursued by both of those churches. Uh, we hadn't I hadn't agreed to come speak at either one yet, but I was trying to decide which one do we feel led by the Lord to go and visit and begin to uh, the the process of candidating. What do we do when we're faced with two options and both of them good? What do we do when we've got a choice to make and either way we go, it could be a good choice. You ever had that situation? You ever face the thing between two good things? That can drive you nuts. If I choose this, that'd be good. If I choose that, it would be good. Well, which one? They may not be just the same. They could be at opposite ends of the spectrum like Colville and Culver City. But they're both good. And they would both be pleasing to the Lord. So how do we choose? I wrote a devotion the other day. And, and to open it up, I said, one of the most common questions that believers ask is what would God want me to do in this situation? We're faced with that all the time. 
what does God want me to do? Should I, should I move here? Should I buy that? Should I take a position on a, on a church leadership? What, what should I be doing in this position? So again, some of you may be facing that decision today or next week or next year because those decisions come for us all the time and we want to know God's will. We want to follow God. We want to be where He wants us to be. In Exodus, in the beginning part of the Bible, the Israelites are being led out of Egypt. Moses has been assigned the task of leading them through the wilderness and, and taking them out of Egypt. You're, you're familiar with that story. As they went, it said, God went before them in a cloud by day, which was kind of handy because it provided a cooling of the effect of the sun's rays in the wilderness, and by fire of night, a, a pillar of fire at night, which would have had the opposite effect, that in the wilderness and the desert it could cool off quite a bit, and so the fire kept them warm. And again, it was a visual sign of following God. Wouldn't it be great if when we were faced with decisions, God would show up in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night? I'd love that. I don't know about you, but just to know, to have it clear, this is the way I'm going. There's the pillar of fire. Follow that. There's where, that's the way we're going. <coughs> Later on in the Bible, um, some of the leaders of Israel uh, came up with another way of dis determining God's will. It was called Urim and Thummim. You heard of that? It's like dice. They were holy dice. Not Yahtzee dice, but... Uh, Urim and Thummim. And would cast lots like that, and, and, and they had a way of reading those dice to figure out what God was wanting for them. And, and, and God would, I guess, have the dice fall the way they were supposed to. Wish God would give me the numbers for the lottery. That would be really, really great. Gideon put out a fleece. You may be familiar with that story. God had sent a messenger to, to Gideon, an angel, and he had told him, Gideon, I, there's some things I want you to do. And one of those was, of course, the, the battle of Jericho. And he came to him, and, and so Gideon, in trying to determine if this was really what God wants, put out a fleece. And he, and he put some things out on the ground, and then and he asked God, well, if, it, if this is your will, then make it be this way, and if this is your will, make it be that way. People stood, still put out a fleece today. There are people who still use that kind of thing. It's, it's just a, a reasoning kind of thing that, Lord, if you really want me to have that car, I would pray that the financing would go through. That was supposed to get a laugh, I guess it didn't. <laughs> but people do that kind of thing. You know what I'm talking about. Lord, if you really want this to happen, open up that door. If you really want that to happen, and that's kind of their like fleece, right? We really wanted to know what you want for us, God, so help us with that. In a football game, to determine who gets to kick off or who gets to make decision when they kick off, they flip a coin. And sometimes we flip a coin to make a decision. Not very, uh, well, sometimes it works. And now we have the internet and we have Siri. We can ask Siri, right? Siri, how do I boil water? Siri, what should I do about this? Siri, what should I do about that? Have you heard of Siri? Yeah? I don't know how much Siri can help us in our decisions when we're following God. So, we find ourselves with Paul looking at major decisions in our life. We've been going through a study, as you know, in the letter of Philippians. And we're noticing together that much of his writing in Philippians to the church really focuses on life together, how we do things together. We've looked at a number of things, and last week we looked at um, finding the silver lining. And, and just this week, in fact, uh, Pam was sharing with me that she had, was going through something a, a week or two ago and then bumped back into somebody this week when she was going through something again. And she says, God showed me a silver lining, and it was, it was a nice way of seeing how God works in our lives. But He works in our lives as a group of people, as a body. You know, the church was God's idea. It wasn't ours. 
we're social by nature and we like to come together but the church wasn't our idea it was God's idea it's his body where the hands and the feet song goes where the eyes and ears of Christ well as we continue through this letter we see that Paul is faced with a major decision and even in that decision Paul's concern is for the church his concern is for believers in verse 21 of Philippians in the first chapter Paul writes for me to live is Christ and to die is gain for me to live is Christ and to die is gain this, per this perspective really is found throughout Paul's writings you find this in several different places where Paul's his perspective is that my life is all about living for Christ if anybody was focused on living for Christ my goodness Paul was in his the letter to the church in Galatia Paul writes I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I that live but Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me from the time that Paul was confronted on the Damascus Road he's had one laser like focus in life to honor God to follow Christ who do you know in your life that has that type of focus there are not as many as there used to be and it's not necessarily anybody's particular fault but our culture has become so so overwhelming with stuff with stuff if you've been paying attention at all to the news lately you know about all the furor that's going on with with all kinds of, of uh, when you get old you can't think of words all of a sudden when you want to protests protests going all over the globe there's all kinds of stuff going on and it seems as though the world is just imploding it can feel that way you know one of the ways to deal with that turn off the news just walk down the street just visit with a neighbor have a cup of coffee with somebody and ignore all of the stuff out there because it tends to wash over us I'm not talking about living by hiding our head in the sand I don't mean that but it seems like there's so much going on around us that it's hard for us to really focus and Paul had one focus you know in his culture wasn't any really all that different maybe they didn't have you know Facebook but he had a lot going on around him as well but he was focused on living for Christ in fact he was so intent on that in 1st Corinthians he writes and you've heard this follow me as I follow Christ you know in a little bit that sounds a little bit like bragging a little you know a little bit arrogant but I don't think that's what he meant at all he was so focused on following Christ that just get in line and follow me and we're gonna do this together that was Paul that was Paul a few weeks back I mentioned a fellow in our church up in Spokane that uh, he lives such a life of focus like that his name was Pat and Pat loved the Lord and Pat loved the people who were in the church and he had a way of just being so approachable you know people with yes faces do you do you know people with no faces that's a different law isn't it Pat had a yes face Paul was approachable Paul was somebody people wanted to gather around was too <laughs> Pat was so approachable and the way that he lived his life in order to honor God began to reach out into the people around him and as I said when uh, we when he had his funeral person after person after person got up and began to share the difference that they had made his granddaughter accepted the Lord because of his passing she realized how much that that he wanted to live for the Lord and honor the Lord that his very life and death impacted her to the point that she gave her life to the Lord as she's been serving him since and she's a wonderful young lady this same Paul 
with this same focus is now at the point, as we find in Philippians, that he's in prison for teaching and preaching the gospel, for following Christ. And, and, the, and the Jewish people weren't very crazy about that because he was, you know, they, he was teaching something that seemed awfully odd to them. And they were after him to shut it down. And so he finds himself having appealed to Caesar in a prison. And there he is and he's facing a death sentence. He may live, he may die, he doesn't know. But he finds himself wrestling with a decision. We pick this up in verse 22 where Paul says, But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. If I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do, know, do not know which to choose. Paul was stymied with the decision should I go on living and helping to serve the church or should I be willing to die and be taken up and be with Christ? He was serious about that. He was serious about making that decision. It says he didn't know which to choose. His first concern is for the church to be with them, to help them to continue to grow and mature in Christ. In speaking again of the Jews' opposition to the gospel in Romans 9, 1-3, part of what he says is, I have great sorrow and unceasing grief because they had not accepted the gospel. They had not accepted the truth about who Jesus was. And he said, I wish myself cut off for the sake of the brethren. Paul said, if I had my way, I would take their place. I would take their punishment so they could know Christ. That's how intent he was, that people would know Jesus and they would accept him as his Savior. Can you imagine that kind of intensity, that kind of passion, where people say, for the sake of him, I'll give up my life because I want him to know Christ. That is a laser-like focus. Continuing in verse 23 of Philippians, Paul says, I am hard-pressed from both directions. It's kind of a word picture. It takes me back to the story of several years ago about a fellow who was, had gone out hiking on his own down in Utah. He was into the Red Rock area down there, and he was following a crevice. And he got into this crevice and the further he got, and he got to the point where he got wedged in and he couldn't get out. Had you heard that story? Do you remember that? He got down there and he was, he was out in the middle of nowhere. He had a cell phone on, but it wouldn't, wouldn't do any good because he was so far down below the, the surface of the ground that he couldn't get a signal. And he hollered and hollered, but there was nobody within 50 or 100 miles of him. He had intentionally gone out by himself to go for a walk, and they found himself stuck between two rocks. He got out. I won't tell you how at this point. I'll tell you later if you want to know. But that's the kind of picture that I see what Paul's talking about. I'm hard-pressed for both sides what to do. As I say, Paul was serious about this. It wasn't this flippant kind of thing where, well, I don't know what I'd rather be. Would I rather be with Jesus or would I rather stay here? He was hard-pressed to make a decision because of his heart for the church. He says, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that's better. And the word for depart, I kind of like this. It means to strike camp. It means to pull down the tent poles and put everything up in the bag and hike off and here we go. Isn't that kind of deep? I'm, glad. I'm kind of at that place where, I don't know, I, that doesn't sound too bad. Just Let's just cash this thing in. I mean, it just seems like it's getting worse. Let's just cash this in and let's take off. Jesus, bring us on home. But there are still people that don't know Jesus. There's still people that don't know Jesus. And they matter. And they matter. You know that all over this world, there are grandmothers and mothers that are praying for their kids that don't know the Lord. And do you know that 
probably every day you pass by one of those kids. Think about that. You probably pay for pray for people in your life that don't know Jesus. You're praying, Lord, please send someone along their path, to cross their path, to sit down and have a conversation with them and really let you know, let, really let them know how much you love them. And draw them to your heart. Do you ever pray those prayers? Of course we do. And yet again, we, we cross over people's paths who are that person who's being prayed for. Jesus still needs us here. He still needs for us to be speaking into people's lives and touching people's lives and heart. So option one, this is a choice that Paul has to make. Option one, live for Christ as he lives in me. That's option one. Option two, depart and be with Christ. Option two. And in that truth, Paul found his answer. In the truth of those decisions, Paul found his answer. See, it's a human tendency that, to think that, he, that God is either behind door A or door B. God is either in this decision or God's in that decision. God is either going to bless this decision or God is going to bless that decision. But when the decision is about honoring God and pursuing Him and following Him, guess what? God can be found over here. God can also be found over here. Do you follow what I'm saying? When, we're, when our heart is right and pure and we're seeking to honor God, whether I go to Colville, whether I go to Culver City, God is going to honor that. Whether I move here or whether I move there, it matters not. God knows that my heart is for Him and I'm seeking to follow Him and seeking to honor Him and He will honor my choice. Because God cares less about your choice and more about your heart. Less about your choice and more about your heart. We get wrapped up in the details. We do. I mean, it's our life. Of course we do. But the reality is, God cares about your whole life. He cares about your whole impact. The people that you touch, the people that you love, and your heart of grace and mercy for people. That's what He cares about. Now, we can accomplish that over here. We can accomplish that over there. God's good with either. Because He can use us over there and He'll send somebody else over there. Am I making sense? Because we tend to think of this is what God wants me to do. Well, and sometimes God is specific. I'm not, I'm not denying that. that. That's possible. But it's far more important that our heart is in the right place. Israel was captive in Babylon for a while. They had been carried off by the enemy. And one of the struggles they had was they were never going to be able to get free. They were never going to be okay. And God was a God over in Palestine. He's geographically locked into this place over here in Israel. And so God couldn't help them. And they just felt helpless. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? God's over in Israel and here we are in Babylon. Oh Lord, have mercy on us. What are we going to do? And the prophet Isaiah had to speak to them and say, God's hand is not shortened. God can reach you wherever you are. Kind of like my grandma. She can reach me in the back seat or the front seat. It makes no never mind. Romans 8.28, you may be familiar with it, says, For we know that God causes all things to work for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Amen? And as, as I said, I want to make sure you understand, I'm not saying that, that there are not situations where God cares, or would rather you go this way or that way, but when we're talking about a decision where both choices are God-honoring, and it's in our heart to seek Him, God can be either place. So how did Paul choose? Well, he shows us back in verse 19. In verse 19, Paul writes, 
and I will rejoice for I know that this shall turn out to be my deliverance through what your prayers and the provision of the Holy Spirit the way he made his choice was through the, the support of the prayers of the people in, in Philippi and other places that he had a relationship with believers and through the Holy Spirit. Prayers. Prayers of fellow believers. Prayers of the church. We prayed right before church for Larry and Myrna and Eloise. Those prayers matter. Those prayers are raised up to God for a brother and a sister and, and, and for God's children. God loves you. And if he loves you, he loves Larry, he's his precious son. And Myrna, precious daughter of God. He loves them. What would we do for them? Anything we could, what would God do for them? Anything he could. I miss my grandmother's prayers. My grandma has passed away back in 1989. That's a long void. That's a long void of my grandmother's prayers because my grandma prayed for me every night of her life. I don't have the least doubt about that. We would go to my grandma's as kids and we would, uh, at night before we went to bed, grandma said, call us. And if I said this already, I'm sorry, but it's just, you know, it's, it's my life. She'd call us around the bed and we'd have to kneel down, my, me and my brothers and my sister, whoever happened to be there at my grandma's that night. We'd gather around the bed, you know, kneel at the bed and grandma would pray with us. And she'd have us pray and then she would pray and we did that every night. And when we weren't there, my grandmother kneeled at that same bed and prayed for us all of her life. And as I got older, because I was, you know, in my younger 30s when she passed away. She would remind us every time we'd see it. I pray for you every... I know you do, Grandma. Don't you stop. You got somebody who prays for you? Are there people that you pray for? You know, there are times in our lives that people are walking through things and we have a tendency to say, you know what, I'm going to be praying for you for that, right? You may have out of doing this, and if, and if so, I'm, I, I'm glad. And if not, I'd like for you to begin to, take, to, to do this as a habit. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to be praying for you. And say, you know what, can we pray? I'd like to pray for you. You know how much difference that makes to a person? It's amazing. It's not a promise that I'm going to and maybe you forgot. It's you stopped, took the time, and prayed with me right then and right there. And you showed me how important I was when you did that. That is so impacting. So go ahead and pray for them when they're not there. But I ask you, if you're not already, take the time and pray for people right where they are. It doesn't matter where you're at. It can be the supermarket. It's, it's not a place thing. It's a time thing. It's a moment thing. Deb and I are involved in ministry with CMA. You wouldn't believe the kind of places we find ourselves and, and just say, can we stop and pray with you right now? And they say, yeah, you betcha. And we might think, well, that seems a little awkward. It's not awkward at all. We're lifting them before the Lord. Now, we don't stand there and put our hands up and, you know, just kind of motion for the crowds to be hushed while we have a prayer. We don't start praying loud prayers for the world to be saved. In fact, Jesus says that's not such, that's not really all that impressive. But we just take those people and we bow our heads and we pray with them. We lift them up before the throne of the Father. The throne of the Father is wherever we are gathered together, lifting somebody up in prayer. The prayers of fellow believers and the Holy Spirit's guidance. Jesus said that I have to go in order that I can send to you the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. And when He comes, He will guide you into all truth. All truth. All truth. Including the truth of those choices that we need to make. The Holy Spirit will guide us. I was sharing with somebody this week about knowing His will. And this person said to me, you know, there have been times that I haven't been really clear on exactly what God wanted me to do, but I can tell you this one thing. I've known when it was, I've been clear on things that God did not want me to do. Huh? Does, that, does that resonate with you? There have been times that you were facing a decision and you knew, <laughs> I am not supposed to take door B. I don't know about door A, but I know I'm not supposed to take door B. God speaks to us. 
as we speak with him. As we speak with him. I had written in this uh, devotion, and I'll share it again with you this morning, simply that when I'm faced with a decision, I know exactly what my grandmother would tell me to do with clarity. I have no doubt. Decision A, decision B. And if I stop and think, what would Grandma want me to do? I know what she want me to do. How do I know that? How do I know? Come on, come on, come on. How do I know? You know she's praying. <clears throat> I know my grandma. I know my grandma. I, <laughs> I know her well. My grandma taught me well. We had a close relationship, and I know my grandma. I know her spirit. I, I, I know her, her perspective. I know her mind. I know her heart. I know my grandma. And I know without a doubt, grandma would want me to have another piece of chocolate. That's for sure. <laughs> but maybe not another cup of coffee. As much as I love coffee, my grandma was concerned about the effect of coffee. Actually, she got us drinking coffee. We would sit in her kitchen and she'd pour coffee and then she'd put, you know, like about that much coffee, about that much milk, you know, in a cup. And we were drinking coffee. And my grandma got me hooked on coffee. Grandma, it's your fault. Um, and, and, but she was concerned that we'd drink too much when we got to be adults. And she told me one time, she said, oh, Timmy, Timmy, I was like 25, Timmy, um, you don't drink like more than two cups of coffee a day, do you? Well, I know, Grandma. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking I drink, drink more than eight cups a day. <laughs> I know what you would want because I know her. We're supposed to know Christ like that. We're not supposed to know about Him. We're supposed to know Him. We're supposed to spend the kind of time, devotional time, reading, you know, it's not this black and white, legalistic, you know, like three pages or two chains, none of that. It's just time. It's time with Christ. So my best time is when I was driving truck. I'd go down the road hours and hours, and even now when I travel back and forth, you know, to Spokane at the beginning and end of the week, I leave the radio off and I spend time with the Lord. That's how we get to know Him. And the better we know Him, the more we know what He wants for us. Because it's His nature. If God could make us, do you think He could figure out how to get a message through to us? Remember, remember Moses saying, but, but I don't know how to speak. And God says, who made your mouth? Who made your brain? I think I can figure out how to get you my message if you would just open up your mouth. So when you're faced with life's pressing decisions, number one, pray and ask prayers of your fellow Christians. Put it out there on the, the prayer chain, your prayer chain. You could, you could send it out in an email or Facebook to your friends, your family. Ask for prayer. I do all the time. Would you guys be praying for me on this? And when they say yes, I take it to the bank that they're going to pray. Seek the Holy Spirit and follow His lead. The Holy Spirit has everything to do with our lives. It's God with us. Trust your relationship and the still small voice in your heart. Trust it. It's there for a reason. God is speaking to your heart. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. If you know it, would you, would you, would you say it with me? We just stumble along together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And in all your ways acknowledge Him. And He will direct your paths. And finally, have confidence. Have confidence that God will be right beside you, whatever choice you make. In verse 20, Paul says, According to my earnest expectations and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. We have the opportunity to honor God and the decisions that we make to honor Him as well. Would you stand with me as we pray?
Father God, we are so very grateful for your presence with us. We are very so grateful that you care enough about each and every one of us. You know us by name. Your word says you know the hairs that are on our head. Lord, I pray that this morning that you would help us, those who are making decisions this week and next week and the following week, because life is process and there's one decision after another. We pray, Lord, that as we seek to honor you and you, you, you know that that is genuine in our hearts, that you would lead us, that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us with that still small voice in our heart, that we would know the direction you would have us go. And then, Lord, when we made a decision, help us not to look back, but to have confidence that you walk with us. We give you praise and glory for your Son, Jesus. In the name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Stop.